and welcome to our Civil Designer Software Technical User Webinar. My name is Charles Scott, and I'll shortly be joined by my colleague, Andrew Cole, who will be demonstrating our latest roads and water design functionality, all incorporated in the current version of Civil Designer, version 8.1 Build 5. At the conclusion of the webinar today, please send us an email using info at civildesigner.com should you wish to arrange a focused on-site or online interactive user group. This user group can be based on today's demonstrated roads and water design functionality for your individual team or office. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Charles, and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Today, we'll be working through the new road subgrade mesh functionality and then the crowned dual carriageway template. After the roads, we'll be having a look at some of the new water features, uh, which includes the water earth connections, street taps, and the fire flow analysis. And then finally, I'll also just work through a, a borehole design uh, that was added previously. So just to get started, we'll have a look at this roads um, selected subgrade mesh surface that, that we've added. Um, the new subgrade mesh um, is created when you run your volume calculations and when you run solidify layer works. You can render this selected SSG surface. You can also do quick box cut volume calculations and Civil Designer can also merge this mesh surface with any DTM surface or in, into any DTM surface. Um, once again, I'm going to use my existing tutor project, which is installed with Civil Designer and can be found in the public documents knowledge base software folder. I'm just going to start by looking at the display settings, um, the new road shading um, settings that have been added. You'll see there's a new checkbox for the final design mesh to display. And then you've also got the new SSG checkbox that you can activate. These um, would display with their own allocated pens. Um, you can see in the corner there, there's a new SSG um, subgrade mesh color that you can use. So I'm going to close the display settings and then move on to the design of a new road which we'll then use to show you how to generate this new SSG mesh. To add a new road, um, file select road file okay and I'm adding a new road with intersection so I'll just my alignment so alignment horizontal graphical insert I'm just going to do a rough alignment through this road. This road reserve. Okay, just must start an NPI. I'm going to finish that off. And then I'm going to allow the road expert to just finish that road design for me. Okay. So once the road is done, it's just used the default uh, road control panel elements. Okay, and then I'm just going to move my start PI just a little bit so we can get those auto junctions to be done at the start and the end PI. So if it finds an intersecting road and the main road, it's going to put in the auto junction. Okay, the Default radius is 10. I'm just going to leave it at 10 meters, and that's for road 25's intersection. Okay, so the default bellmouth radiuses were used over there. Okay, then I think we should just focus in on this particular new road. So I'm just going to go to display settings and hide all the other roads. And then just activate road 25. Okay. Right, so there's the new road. And if you look at the cross sections, section graphical edit, 
I'm just going to show you. So with the normal template layer works, remember you had to extract um, additional cross-section data with Solidify layer works to see those additional road layers. And the alternative um, would be to show your template layer work box as a group. Okay, but we want to now extract uh, that mesh which will be underneath the bottom road layer, pavement layer. Okay, let me just switch off that layer works box. Okay, closing my cross section. Okay, and then to generate this box, I'm going to be running the mass or volume function. Okay, so mass or volume. You still have the option to run it. Okay, I'm going to make it 97%. You can still do it to your design surface of choice, but in this case, uh, we're going to create the subgrade mesh. You have those options as well to intersect with your batters if you want your layer works to run through in full, especially. Okay, so we calculate. And OK, and results to output, OK. If I just look at my volume results over here, these would be right to the bottom of the subgrade. You can see um, it should have the batter surface listed there, you know, the subgrade. OK, so this is my box cut volumes that we've got. And the program then automatically generated that design mesh um, in the road. So just to show you that, I can go to my road strings. If I switch off the final design mesh, which is your road design levels, there you can see the subgrade mesh displayed. Okay. And then maybe just to verify that in the cross section, if I go to my cross sections and I switch on. So this cross section, the mesh is stored to layer 127 in your road layers, your road cross section layers. Remember the vertical alignment is done on those vertical alignment generated levels on layer 128. So we want 127, which is the subgrade mesh. And there you see that mesh line, the cross-section line <coughs> displaying. Okay, so that correlates, coincides with your template layer works. So define template layer works <coughs> and then that subgrade box that we've generated. Okay, so the next step with this mesh is to now Going to switch off those layer works. Okay, so the next step would be now to <coughs> have a look at it in the, the render view. Okay, I'm just going to zoom in just to show you what it looks like in that 3D render view. You can see that's the new mesh surface with that road string shading visibility on. Okay, you can see the drainage. I've got that drainage display on that red and displaying your low point on that Balmer. Okay, so now the next step I want to do now is to actually merge the subgrade surface into my DTM surface. Okay, so if I switch that display off, just switch my brake lines on. So you can see that that's my one original ground surface. And you can see there's no merging, no road data in there at the moment. Okay, so we're going to translate and merge that surface or our civil designer to translate it. If I switch the road on again, then select the road. Okay, and this is also an option under that alignment, um, horizontal trans cross sections translate. Okay, so we're looking for the SSG mesh. 
to be translated and merged into our one original ground surface. Okay, so I'm just select it. And then I'm going to use the right click road operations. Okay, so the last one is the string translate. Then you've got a couple of options. Um, we're going to translate it into that one original ground, the natural ground surface. You can do the entire road model, um, just the carriageways, or in this case, just the subgrade box. And you've got an option to translate all. In this case, we're just translating the current road. That translate all would do all your roads, translate and merge it into any specified surface. Okay. So let me just switch that road visibility off, and then we can see the road break lines that merged the road into your natural ground. Okay, then just once again, just to have a look at that render view of the merged surface now. So that new mesh, road mesh of ours allows you to translate and merge your road surfaces. Okay. All right, so that's that subgrade mesh surface, and then I'm going to move on to the crowned dual carriageway design. I'm going to open up this crowned dual road project. Okay. Just let it open up. As you can see, this particular road, um, if you look at the contours, it's a conventional dual carriageway road, which I'm going to then convert to a crown dual carriageway. You can see from the contours, there's a constant crossfall on each carriageway. If I look at the cross section, just zoom in a bit, so you can see there's a 2% grade cross full grade on each carriageway. If I page down a bit, down to that horizontal curve, you can see the super elevation happening around that pivot point on the center line. Okay, so we want to now introduce a crowned dual carriageway. So I'm just going to close this one and then go to the template paths, tools, template paths. And you can see I've got a crowned dual carriageway template. Just right click on that and go to my template editor. And there you can see visually already there's the crowned carriageway the dual carriageway. If I click on the carriageway button, you can see there's the conventional dual carriageway and then the added button now for the dual crown carriageway. The settings are still pretty much the same. Your center line to pivot gets defined and then pivot to medium break point, pivot to shoulder break point or road edge. And then these grades at the moment, your outside lane, um, would be linked to the inside lane on the other side of the carriageway, or the opposite carriageway. If I just change that one just to show you, negative five, you can see the other lane's carriageway would have the same grade. Okay, I'm just going to set that back to negative two. Okay. All right, and then close that, and then I'm going to not have to save it. Didn't really change anything. And then we're going to go back to our edge levels and alignment edge levels, edit super. Okay, to the templates tab. 
Okay, and I'm going to change it to that number one template, the crowned dual carriageway template. Close my edge level spreadsheet and save the changes, yes. Okay, and then I'm just going to regenerate my edge levels and apply my template. And then you should see immediately from the contours how the each lane now has the crown on it. Okay. And we can just have a look at the cross section as well. I'll go to my section graphical edit. Just to look at that. You can see the crown. Let me just switch on my I'm gonna go layer details. Switch on the pivot points. Okay, and zoom in a bit. You can see your pivot and the crowned carriageways. Okay, I'm just paging around so you can see the super elevation development as we get into that horizontal curve. You can see that duplication of the grades uh, of the outside and inside land. Okay, so that's basically the end of the new road features for today. And then I'm going to be moving on to the new water features. Okay, so for that, I'm going to move back to my tutor project. And we're going to be starting off um, with the new earth connection functionality that's been added to water so i just want to switch on my water network visibility and i can switch my triangulation lines off you can see this tutor has already got a few earth connections added um, you've got some near and far earth connections those in view currently are the double connections Okay, so just to have a look at those various um, settings, we're going to go to our water application firstly, and then to tools, uh, the catalog, and the water user categories. Okay, so we've got those three built in CSIR water user categories the low, medium, and high. With the red book values built into them. Okay, you do have an option to add additional water user categories um, if you wanted to name them and set the defaults. You can close that. Okay. And then I'm going to graphical earth connections. Those are the three options to draw a new earth connection to edit or remove or delete um, your existing water earth connection. Okay, so we're adding in this case or drawing. And then those are those default settings. Um, the distances from your front boundary over there, front street side boundary distance from your side boundary and then the depth of the earth connection you've got your categories that you can select from and we've got either single or double if you uncheck the double using a single and then you can have the number of units uh, linked to that earth connection okay so the prompt there once i've accepted is to indicate the front boundary line and then your side boundary line. And you can see the earth connection gets popped in. Okay, so just front, just read the prompt. Remember to always read your prompts. Front boundary and side boundary line. And you'd carry on inserting those as needed. Gonna do more and I'll just do an example of a single earth connection as well. Okay. 
Okay, so I just have to find an earth to add to. And I'm going to go back to graphical earth connections, draw, and just uncheck the double option and accept. Okay, so front boundary line again. And then this time you'd have to click on the right side, so on the earth side of that side boundary line. Okay, so it's your front boundary and then. The correct side, not that one. I need to go on this side. Okay. And then quit. Okay, so you have got some options um, when it comes to your analysis. Let's just have a look at the data summary. You can see those demands are listed there separately. And they would be added to your total demands, those earth connection demands. Okay. All right. And then just to have a look at the actual display settings for the earth connections, you can put in the discharge and we're going to put in the pressure as well. I'll just make the text a little bit smaller and take the box out. Maybe just the line thickness, it's, it's a little bit thicker than our pipe thickness. Okay, so I still need to run our analysis quickly. Um, time simulation, just to get those values to update. Okay, and there we could see the discharge and the pressure. You can see how those values updated. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to my street taps. Okay, so similarly to the others, um, to earth connections, you have to set your defaults. Firstly, we've got a 15 mil um, and a 20 mil standard type of tap. You can set all your defaults, required flow per tap. Um, there's also an option to restrict your flow if you check the box. You can restrict your flow for that tap. Number of people, um, the recommended is 150 or the maximum, so 100 is a good amount. And then your 25 liters per consumer per day. And then you can also set your demand pattern. These values are all based on the Red Book guidelines. Okay, so let's have a look at those street tap values with your IDs and your flows. Okay, so I'm just going to set it up before we go and have a look at these. And we've got the circle to indicate the minimum distance as well. Just to note that the flow is in liters per minute. Okay, generally our stuff is in liters per second. And then I'm going to show the default color scheme at the moment for those circles. Okay, so to add a standpipe, um, the street tap, I'm going to draw a street tap. You can see there's that minimum walking distance radius displaying. I'm going to insert a few with that walking radius taken into consideration. Just use the quickest option over here. Okay, so inserting a few nodes. So obviously you'd want to place those quite strategically. You can actually change these defaults while you're working or inserting the street taps. Okay, so I'm going to run a simulation here, a time simulation, so that you can see how those street taps, the flows are displayed. So time simulation, I run it. Okay, so that's just going to use your normal demand 
per capita demand. Okay, but if I run a single step with maximum demand and my seasonal peak, then you can see that it'll use the correct tap flow values. Okay, so the, the normal time simulation just use your demand, your per capita demand added flows. Okay, if I do a 3D render over here, you can see there's a view of the street tap. Okay. Could have probably used a better color but just to show you to visualize it in 3D. Okay. And then I want to move on to my fire flow analysis design. Okay, you can see our hydrant default settings over here. Um, the hydrants based on your fire risk categories. We've got the red book built in those first five risk categories. Um, high being for your industrial areas, moderate, and then your lower risk groups. With your minimum fire flow rates, the minimum flow per hydrant, everything from the red book, and then the simultaneously active hydrants um, within that 270 radius. Got your minimum residual head, your minimum distances as well. And then your fire duration can be used for reservoir sizing. You've got an option to add your own categories as well. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it as moderate risk in this case. Okay, and let me switch off the um, street taps for now. And I'm going to set the defaults for the hydrants. Okay, your fire hydrants, and change the color to the blue. Okay, and make the residual. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm just going to also draw that circle indicating your minimum distance uh, that your hydrant should be apart. Okay, so graphically, I'm going to go add the drawing and hydrant. Okay, once again, these should be strategically positioned, but I'm just going to slot them in for this exercise. Okay. We'll find the closest node. Pop it in over there. You can see that minimum distance um, shading between hydrants that should ideally overlap. Just position this one. Snap on a node. Okay, this is quite a small little model, so ideally you should use a bigger model to see the correct results, but I'm just showing you exactly how to make use of this function. Okay, the next up would be to run your analysis and that would be the fire flow analysis. Okay. Okay, the applying of the seasonal peak is up to you. For this particular example, um, I think I think I'll switch it off. The seasonal peak will be applied to the the rest of the network. So we want to model this for worst case scenario. If we look in our results browser, we'll see. We'll look at the results for the hydrants. You can see if I open up the tree there, you can check the results for each hydrant individually. And all the hydrants that are in that uh, 270 radius. And then finally, you've got a summary of your residual heads for each hydrant. Okay, so that would be the minimum pressure at each hydrant. You can see mine are quite low. But this is just an, to show you how it actually works.
Okay, so those are essentially those new functions. Um, I'm going to move on to the display settings quickly. Those residual, residual hedge, so minimum pressures can be shown with the color range um, as well, that color scheme. Okay, so that would be all less than zero residual pre pressure, that color that you're seeing now. Okay, and then your borehole functionality. I'm just going to delete this old borehole over here. So I'm moving on to the boreholes. Okay, this had a borehole in it. So I'm going to go graphically draw in a new borehole. That same position, it'll snap to the node. Okay, so generally you would need your hydrologic, hydrological report for doing this design. Okay, so let me query my borehole. And you'd need all those yield drawdown results to be able to set the right levels over there, your water at rest. Um, I'm just going to make it 17. And then my water while operating is 35. And the pump intake is at 38 meters. So you'd need that. Um, pump testing information to set that correctly. Okay, that recommended yield from this particular model, we're going to use 11 liters per second. Okay, then your equipment, um, if you click on that length, it'll just pick it up from that pump intake level. I'm just going to set um, some default column and shaft values. Ideally, you'd need these values from your manufacturers. Minor losses, I'm going to set to seven. Your valves and bends and reducers. And then my pump delivery, I'm going to set to a fixed delivery of 9.5 liters per second, based once again on my data summary information. Okay, your drawdown curve, these are from your I'm testing values, so I'm just going to put in the discharge and drawdown in meters to generate a drawdown curve, which will make for much more accurate um, analysis or design. If I select to use the drawdown curve to make it a much more efficient design. Okay, those are those depths relative to your datum. Okay, just to have a look at that equipment again. Okay, so we're going to run a single step analysis just to pick up some duty points for our pump selection. Okay. So if I go back to my borehole, back to the equipment tab, and I want to go to the select pump option. Okay, you've got a minimum, maximum, and average head to consider when you're selecting your pump. So I'm going to use maximum and then just search for a pump. Okay, there is an option as well to adjust the speed of your pump. And that looks like a good duty point. So I'm going to select that. And that will be added into the borehole. Okay, then just on the level side, I'm going to set my reference reservoir. And then my on and off level, my level control. So this is linked to my reservoir. Okay. Okay. Okay, so if we look at that reservoir, I just want to check my ID number. Uh, yeah, I used ID number two. So let me just go back to that data borehole and I need to change my control to reference reservoir number one. Okay, and then I'm just switching off that initially working off. Okay. Okay, so now we can run our time simulation, check the level in the reservoir. Okay, and I'm closing that and I'm going to have a look at my graphs for the borehole. 
very firstly, let's see the reservoir level. Okay. And then if I look at the graph for the borehole, you can see there's the discharge. And then when it switches off, okay, I can read in a result there. At any specific time, let me just go read in a result while the pump is working. And then if you look at the results um, for the borehole, I can go and check my efficiency, etc. for our newly added pump. Okay, so that's pretty much covering all the new water functionality. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. And back to you, Charles. Thank you, Andrew. That was great. We'll be planning our next webinar on the 27th of July, when we'll be demonstrating our new 3D CAD animation and design verification functionality. The registration notifications for this webinar will be sent on Monday, the 2nd of July. Thank you very much for your valuable time this afternoon. As I stated earlier, please email us using info at civildesigner.com should you wish to arrange a focused on-site or online interactive user group for your individual team or office. We will be leaving the session running for the next 30 minutes should you wish to send us any questions with regards to Andrew's software demonstration for your regional consultants to answer. Have a great weekend. Please, please remember to ensure you're always using the latest version of Civil Designer, version 8.1, bold 5. I'll make sure this link is included in Monday's registration notification. Take care and goodbye from Civil Designer's head office here in a wet Cape Town. Good afternoon.